Here's part two of a two-part vid. There's a link to part one, which I already did. We've still got six more bosses I've yet to discuss, and a short intro too, which is always a plus. And if you want to see my other Cuphead videos, there'll be a link to a playlist in the description below. All right, let's go. <sighs> Screw this guy. Yeah, that's all I have to say. Before Matchstick showed up and scorched my other contenders for worst boss, this smug-faced, snoz honking son of a failed theater major was the bane of my existence in this game. Whether he was embodying carnival rides, performing a bump and run, or living at his brony fantasies, he drove me nuts. In hindsight, he's really not that difficult, and it was mostly just a get good moment on my part. But I tell ya, I felt so freaking satisfied when I finally put a killing bullet between those dumb, creepy peepers. And credit words do, he did give me a great idea for a Cuphead episode. Now I'm sure that we're all aware of the classic scared of clowns trope. It's a common fear for a lot of people and it's appeared in tons of media. From horror movies like It, to kids cartoons like Animaniacs and Billy and Mandy. And just from watching the behavior in his boss fight, I can imagine half the Inkwell Isles developing calrophobia just from meeting this guy. Like look at that freaking balloon head! Someone get me some needles right away! Here you go! Ah! Not you! But in the Cuphead Show's case, instead of making the protagonist scared of clowns, which is all too common in animation, we're gonna make the essence of pure evil himself into a complete cowrophone. And this crippling fear is gonna lead to him making some really bad decisions that Cuphead will have to clean up for him. Let me set the scene. So we all know from the end of the Cuphead Show Season 2 that Mugman was taken to hell as collateral after Cuphead refused to return his pitchfork. Now it's fair to assume that this cliffhanger will be undone in a single episode, much like Season 1's. However, in my version, the devil only agrees to release Mugman's soul if Cuphead completes a list of chores for him. Basically, Big D has some unfinished business that he can't be bothered to do himself, so if Cuphead completes these grueling tasks for him, Mugman's soul will be free once again. It's kind of like a soul contracts light kind of deal, but instead of being the entire plot like it was in the game, it'll only be about one to three episodes at most, a little mini arc. Trust me, I would love to see the soul contract plot in its entirety in the show, but the more episodes go by, the more I'm starting to accept the fact that that's likely never gonna happen. So might as well have a nice little substitute. Meanwhile, on Mugman's side, while Cuphead is out running some unholy errands, the devil keeps Mugman far away from everyone in an undisclosed location, manipulating him and feeding him lies. He says it's quite a shame, your precious big brother never did return for you. I suppose he was too preoccupied with his own frivolous pursuits to give a single care about his beloved blue brother. At first, Mugman completely denies it, but then the devil shows him some visual reminders of all the quarreling and disagreements they had, all the times that Cuphead didn't learn his lesson, to try and sway Mugman towards his way of thinking. This would really show that despite the devil being a walking punchline both in and out of universe, he's still the antagonist of the story, and when push comes to shove, he could be just as ruthless and menacing as the best of them. It'd be just like what Release the Demons did for DICE. And I'm not gonna lie, if they actually use the constant fighting from Season 2 as a plot point in Season 3, I'll take back all that stuff I said about the fighting being a negative. Also, if you're wondering where the devil got those visual aids from, remember that he has an entire staff of little demon dudes monitoring the entire world at all times. No doubt at least one of them would have footage of the Cup Bro shenanigans. Now with all that being said, where does our sweet Beppe come in? Well, in my story, the Devil's first assignment involves Cuphead tracking down our signature scary sideshow act and making him go from clowning around to clown and out. Remember that soul-stealing carnival that appeared in the series premiere? Well, I like to think that the Devil actually commissioned Beppy to build that park. All the rides and attractions and underhanded soul-swiping apparatuses, that was all his design. There's only one problem, though. The devil is absolutely horrified by clowns. They freak him out, they give him night terrors, they make him soil his non-existent pants, they do everything short of making him freeze in terror. So you can imagine the problems that come with having a clown for a business partner. He didn't even have anywhere else to turn since Beppy is the only guy he knows who does these kinds of commissions. And as expected, this fear comes back to bite him in the butt in a big way. Before the carnival was made, Beppy and the Devil had a special meeting in Hell to discuss some specifics for the deal. And while Beppy was very goofy and jokey, just a very innocent looking clown fella, the Devil is constantly on edge. With half of him listening, and the other half going, I want him to go away now, I want him to go away now, I want him to go away now! 
After a few hours pass and they eventually get to the end of the meeting where they discuss Beppy's payment, the devil is pretty much ready to just check out at that point. And before Beppy can even say a word, the devil says, Oh, there's no need to discuss specifics. I'm sure you do a fine job, worthy of compensation. In fact, why don't you get started on our little venture, and when you return, I'll do exactly as you ask. Now goodbye, please go away, take all the time you need. <sighs> Stickler is pretty quick to point out that he's gonna expect you to follow through on your word when he returns, sir. But the devil's not worried, saying, Oh please, he's a cotton candy-brained clown. What could he possibly want? A new squirting flower? A tiny jack for his clown car? No reason to fear this. But when Beppy finishes the carnival and comes back for his payment, we find out that he's not just an innocent clown, he is a massive devil fanboy. In the game, Beppy always struck me as a joker type. He's vibrant and silly, always cracking jokes and whatnot, but he's also psychotic and sadistic with a deranged laugh to match. So it would make total sense for someone like him to idolize the most well-known public provider of chaos and mischief. Heck, that's the reason he was so well-versed in soul-stealing technology in the first place. And what does he ask for as payment? He wants to be one of the devil's top assistants. To work with his idol, doing crazy things on the daily. If Dices is number one, or used to be, then Beppy would want to be his number two or number three. <laughs> yeah! Bet you're regretting kicking him out fast now, ain't you, bub? Obviously, the devil doesn't want to deal with this two-tone terror for the rest of his life, so he decides to sweeten the deal. He says to Beppy, an assistant? Oh, that sounds just grand, marvelous. <laughs> but what if I could do you one better? Why be the right hand of the devil when you can become the devil? This immediately intrigues Beppy, and the devil says that all he has to do is build him something bigger. Not just a carnival, but a theme park, an amusement empire, his own personal Disneyland without all the rich people favoritism. And just when he thinks it's big enough, go even bigger. If he can impress him, then the devil's position is all his. He even gives him one of his powers, the ability to transform, as a little sample of what he could get if he works really hard. Beppy accepts the deal with freaking bells on, and ever since then, the devil hasn't heard any word from him. CH's job is to go to Beppy's little project site and snatch his soul before he's finished. So Cup heads down to the exact spot, getting there by nightfall, and finds a gigantic theme park that's fully functional, but completely abandoned. He walks around this creepy place. Not a sound to be heard except for a faint bit of music over the intercom. He calls out Beppy's name multiple times until he finally shows himself. I can imagine him changing into a bunch of carnival attractions as he goes on and on about how no one's supposed to be here before the grand opening. They have an epic showdown or chase scene throughout the park, like a more in-depth version of Carnival's finale, with Beppy cracking bad jokes the whole way, just like his boss fight. Eventually, Cuphead uses one of the many soul-stealing gadgets installed throughout the park to nab Beppy's soul and bring it back to Big D. Heck, maybe one of the ways he gets to jump on Beppy is by telling him a joke that really makes him laugh. Like that cannibal clown one from Roll the Dice. That could be a cute callback. So yeah, overall, I think this could be a lot of fun. The devil being constantly terrified would be hilarious. Beppy idolizing the devil makes sense for his character, and it can act as a sort of Carnival 2.0 in both concept and execution. Every season needs its signature horror episodes, and I think taking a wild ride in Beppy's bumper car of craziness could be just what the Mad Doctor ordered. Ooh, speaking of Mad Doctors... Man, I just feel really bad for Dr. Cal. Not just because his tiny stature, grape soda hair, and ear-splitting laugh ensure that he'll never feel the touch of a woman, but also because the fandom kinda hates him. A lot of worst boss lists have this fellow near the top, and personally, I don't think it's justified. Sure, he's hard, some parts of his fight are kinda unfair, second phase is too easy, third phase is too long, I've heard the complaints. But I've always gotten this sense of satisfaction from fighting him, multitasking while a billion things are coming at you, chipping away at his offenses as you go. I've always loved fights where you destroy each weapon one by one. It gives me little hints of dopamine as the battle goes on. And I also like his multifold inspiration too, taking hints from Mickey and the Mad Doctor, Dr. Wily with his little one-man hovercraft, and even a bit of Dr. Robotnik with that Chaos Emerald he pulls out. Yes, that's where that was. Personally, I think Cal gets a little too much hate. He's nowhere near my favorite boss, but I say he deserves a bit of justice. Let's show him some love. Hashtag Cal's our pal. Anyway, for his episode, I'm going to be pulling from a well that the Cuphead show likes returning to a lot. It's the Cuphead and Mugman start off fighting, but then through wacky circumstances learn their lessons and become better people, except for sometimes when they just reset by the end of the episode. Episodes. 
Yay! Yeah, these episodes are exactly what they sound like, and some of them are pretty good, like Sweet Temptations and Another Brother. But instead of teaching the bros about temptation or cautiousness, this episode will teach them the age-old lesson about how cheating and taking shortcuts is not the way to go. It'll start off with the cup bros playing some kind of game, like horseshoes for example. Mugman is playing completely fairly and is actually doing really well. Only for Cuphead to throw a whole quartet of horseshoes at one time, which land directly on the peg. Mugman goes to investigate, only to find out that Cuphead wasn't using real horseshoes, he was just using painted magnets, which obviously went straight for the metal pole when they got near it. Mugman tells Cuphead that he can't just cheat throughout life like that, it's dishonest and wrong. But Cuphead tells him, eh, you're just jealous cause you didn't think of it first. The two boys decide to play a different game, like maybe go bowling or something. Cuphead, Mugman, let's go bowling. And on their way to the bowling alley, Cuphead is spinning one of his magnet horseshoes on his finger, still proud of his cheating idea. But then the magnet immediately flies away from his hand and attaches to something that catches Cuphead's eye. A giant metal sign that reads, Come see giant robots. Turns out that there's a science symposium of sorts, featuring the future of robotics and machines. And it's all hosted by a tiny little scientist named Dr. Cow. He gives a speech about the power of science and ingenuity and blah blah blah. Cuphead doesn't care, he just wants to play with the robots. Mugman tells Cuphead that he thought that they were gonna go bowling, but Cuphead says, why go bowling when we can go bowling with giant robots? Dr. Cow, being the genius that he is, listens to the bros, looks at the clearly fake horseshoe on his sign, and pieces together what's going on. Clearly some competitive dishonesty between these two. So he says, you know what, I'll do you boys one better. Instead of playing with the robots, how'd you like to build your own robots? The boys are both intrigued by this, so Cal announces to the public that in just a few days, a small taste of the future of robotics engineers will be shown off. These two nice boys will each build a robot of their own design and present it to the public, and the winner shall be handsomely rewarded. Once the show's over, Cal takes both bros to the junkyard where he often finds scrap for his own machines. He hands each of the brothers a book on very basic robotics and tells them that they're free to build whatever they want using the various things they find in the junkyard. It could be as simple as an automatic feeding fork or as complex as a drivable mech. Once Cal leaves, both bros start reading their books with Cuphead getting increasingly bored and Mugman taking it seriously. Eventually CH just tosses the book in the trash and starts wandering around the junkyard, kicking cans and whatnot. Eventually though, he comes across something amazing. A gigantic pre-made robot mech just lying unconscious in the junkyard. He hops right in the cockpit, boots it up, and it works like a dream. Cuphead walks his bot right over to Mugman who's still reading his book, and Mugman can't believe what he's seeing. He immediately cries foul, saying that Cuphead didn't build that thing, he couldn't have. But Cuphead says, you can't prove a thing, this was all my design, and I still got four days left. Cue a montage of Mugman trying to build a robot properly over the next few days, while Cuphead does all kinds of goofy shenanigans with his giant bot, like dancing, or lifting weights, or kicking stuff, or other stupid things. Eventually, the Day of Judgment comes. Mugman shows up with a not super impressive, but still cute and functional little robot, while Cuphead comes in moonwalking like a champ in his massive shiny mech. And at the end, the doctor declares Mugman the winner. Cuphead is super confused, and Cal reveals that the robot that Cuphead is piloting is actually his robot. He left it in the junkyard as a test for the bros to see if they would cheat, and Cuphead took the bait. Mugman wins the cash prize, maybe he goes out for ice cream with his new tiny little robot friend, and Cuphead gets a moral lesson, empty pockets, and an empty belly. Serves him right. Again, this is a formula that the show likes to use a lot, and I think Cal would be perfect for one of these episodes. Cuphead learns a valuable lesson, Cal gets to show his intelligence by pulling a fast one on him, and maybe Mugman can have some moments where he bonds with his little handmade creation, like a boy and his dog. That'd be adorable. Maybe not super flashy, but very functional, just like a well-made robot. Easily one of the top bosses I've always wanted to see in the Cuphead show. You know, aside from Fish and Hips, but she's already got her own episode. This guy gives off such fun yet psychotic vibes whenever I fight him. Like Genie's aesthetic with Discord's personality. That smug grin he's always got on. The way he varies up his attacks each time you fight him to keep you guessing. Even the way he tries to use your own weapons and likeness against you. Like if I can't beat you, maybe you can. That's pretty smart. 
Personally, I really like this fight. It's another one that's close to my favorites. And an episode starring this hunk of phenomenal cosmic power has the potential to be one of the most imaginative episodes of the series. And let me tell you folks, I got a wild one for you here. So this would be another one of those Devil's Chores episodes like Beppy's was. But in this case, instead of the devil being scared, it involves the devil being outsmarted. You see, there was this little kid, whom the devil can't even remember the name of, who originally signed a deal with him to trade his immortal soul for a lifelong dream of his. He's always loved the tales of the Arabian Nights, and all the magical adventures they'd have. So his wish is to become an all-powerful genie, just for a week to see what it's like. Seems like a fair transaction, so the devil signs the deal and sends this little guy to genie school, where they shape him into a magical deity lickety-split. We can say that he knows the principal or something, and he owes him a favor. But once the week is over and the devil asks for his soul payment, the kid says, I'm afraid I can't do that. Turns out that even before he went to genie school, this kid had studied genies for years, including genie politics. And because genies technically supersede the laws of all existing realities, cosmos, and existences, they also have authority above all legal documents and jurisdictions in this universe or any other, meaning their contract is null and void, and he doesn't have to pay a dang thing. So, see ya! Yup, this kid pulls a fast one on the devil and is now able to be an all-powerful genie for all eternity. This angers the devil to no end, and he assigns Cuphead to go get the soul of that deceitful little brat. Cuphead asks how he's supposed to do that, and the devil says he doesn't know, just get it done. Cuphead follows a map that the devil gave him which leads to a massive temple in the middle of the desert. Jeez, I hope he's got enough brain juice to drink, that's gonna be a long journey. Anyway, he happens upon the genie that the devil told him about, and believe it or not, the genie actually recognizes him. At first, Cuphead is confused, but then it hits him. Remember this line from Roll the Dice? That's for you, Jimmy, and you know what for. A lot of people associated this with Jimmy the Great, despite the spelling in the subtitles being J-I-M-M-Y. But guess what? I actually have a way to work that line into the episode. It turns out that the kid who tricked the devil is actually Cuphead's old acquaintance, Jimmy. Jimmy was a complete smart aleck and know-it-all and a massive jerk to Cuphead, always correcting him and making him look like an idiot. Which to be fair, he kinda is. At first he thought that Jimmy left town at some point, and good riddance, but nope, turns out that he tricked old BLZ and became an omnipotent cosmic deity. Heck, if you wanted, you can even make a joke about their names, like, I am no longer Jimmy. I am now Jimmy! Wow, you may be smart, but you're not creative, are you? Jimmy still sees Cuphead as a complete moron, but Cuphead says that he's not, and he can prove it. Jimmy says, Is that so? And actually conjures up a lamp for Cuphead to run. You know the genie gig, every time you rub the lamp, you get three wishes. You can have anything you want as long as it's not against these rules. Why don't you give it a whirl? Cuphead does just that, but every time he makes a wish, Jimmy finds some way to misconstrue it. Like if he wishes for a million bucks, a stampede of a million male deer trample him. If he wishes for giant muscles, these things show up and try to eat him. If he wishes for world peace, a literal piece of the world appears above him and crushes him, etc. Cuphead keeps rubbing the lamp over and over again, getting three wishes after three wishes, basically rubbing all the paint off, but he just can't seem to outwit Jimmy. Jimmy laughs and suggests that he quit, but then Cuphead finally comes up with an idea. He asks Jimmy that he has to do anything he wants as long as he wishes it, right? And Jimmy says yes. So Cuphead rubs the lamp one last time, looks right at Jimmy and says, I wish. That's it. And Jimmy doesn't know how to respond to this. You wish for what? You gotta be specific. And Cuphead says, no he doesn't. That's not one of the rules. I wish. Now grant it. Jimmy kinda goes into a panic since the wish is so stupidly simplistic he has no idea how to tweak it or even grant it. All he said was, I wish, which means that his desires could amount to anything in the known universe. So Jimmy basically has no choice but to allow Cuphead to have whatever he wants, no strings attached. He uses his powers to create a blank canvas of reality where Cuphead's every desire will come true. Yeah, I know I've used the whole void plot point before, but I think it really fits here. So now with all of reality at his fingertips in this dimension, Cuphead gets exactly what he wants. He wishes for Jimmy to no longer be a genie, he wishes for his soul to be put in a balloon so he can carry him around and maybe knock him into a few things, he wishes for the balloon to say Cuphead's smarter than me on it, and he wishes for a door out of this dimensional dump. He gives the soul to the devil, and end of episode.
Yeah, this one might seem a little bit confusing at first, but I really like the idea of Cuphead fighting a smart Alec Genie and all the crazy shenanigans that could come with his wishes being twisted. Then in the end, it's Cuphead being as simple-minded and underthinking as possible that eventually gets him the win. And similar to my Sally stage play idea, if you scrapped the devil's involvement entirely, you'd still have a really funny episode about Cuphead outwitting a smug genie jerk. So it could work either way. Look at this! Look at this! I'm so ticked off that I'm molting! That is called cannibalism, my dear children, and is in fact frowned upon in most societies. Make a little birdhouse in your soul. Please rise in the presence of Her Royal Honeyness, Ruma Honeybottom, the sweetest monarch in the land. Though that's only by her association with honey, she's actually quite cruel. In fact, get her ugly mug off the screen, I don't want to see it anymore. Ah yes, Rumor Honeybottom, a massive bee in both senses of the word. She sits on her big baby-making buttocks while her literal hive mind does most of the work. Heck, she doesn't even show up for her first phase. We gotta fight one of her pole beast officers instead. And we're forced to shoot him one day before retirement. That's not cool. Oh, and don't even get me started on the state of her workers. Look at this guy. Disheveled, overworked, barely alert enough to keep his own body afloat. Rumor doesn't know. She doesn't know that Barbara got laid off two days ago because the company she worked for was downsized. She doesn't know that little Jenny needs emergency thorax replacement surgery, so he has to work overtime just to pay for it. The only joy he feels at the end of the day is to go home and see his family. But he's only allowed to leave if he can make it from one end of the screen to the other. That's all he's got to do. But then he drops into my line of fire and kicks the bucket. You want to blame me for shooting him? How about you blame her for not putting emergency exits for employees to evacuate the hive during a time of war? She doesn't know, and she'll never know because she doesn't care about them. And now, he's never gonna make it home, is he? What about my kids? Wow, that got dark really fast. And anyway, episode, episodes, let's talk about episodes. So this one's pretty simple, but hopefully a lot of fun. We've seen the Cup Bros pull off a scam or two, but in this story, they're gonna handle a good old fashioned heist. A honey heist to be specific, and their buddy Chalice is gonna help them. It'll start off with Elder Kettle being sick and bedridden. It's nothing major, but the bros want to help him get better. EK tells them that one thing that would really help right now is some tea with honey. Specifically brewed inside of him, since, you know, he's a freaking kettle. They have the water and the tea leaves, but no honey to be found. They try going to pork grinds and other stores in the area, but no one seems to have any honey. They did notice a lot of help wanted ads in the window, but that doesn't really help their situation. The bros are about ready to give up, but then who happens to walk by but our favorite little hard shoe hustler? The bros explain their plight, and Chalice gives them a tip about where some honey might be. If they want some of that luscious bee nectar, they're gonna have to get it straight from the source. The home of her highness, Rumor Honeybottom. Sadly, this monarch doesn't give her precious honey out to just anyone, but of course in Chalice's eyes, she's not just anyone. She manages to charm the guards to bring her to the queen for an audience, but when Chalice tries to charm the queen out of her honey, she actually fails this time. Rumor says that she's seen every charm in the book, and they no longer affect her. If you want honey, go buy some, you tap dancing deadbeat. They throw Chalice out, and she's kind of shocked that her usual charms didn't work this time. The bros say that it's okay, they could just tell EK what happened and he'd understand, but Chalice refuses to give up after being embarrassed like that. She turns into a ghost and tries to steal some honey straight up, but that doesn't work either because it turns out that there's a ghost-proof shield around Rumor's abode that she set up using her magical powers. And she takes this as another opportunity to mock Chalice again. Now Chalice is really mad, and she's getting that honey one way or another. The three of them start planning a full-on heist to break into Rumor's little complex and grab some of that honey for themselves. I'm not going to map out the whole thing, but one event that does happen involves them getting caught by someone in the hive. Not Rumor, not even one of her guards, but just one of her worker bees. The cups beg him not to blow their cover because all they want is a little honey, and he doesn't. But sadly, they end up getting caught at the last second anyway, because surprise, turns out that Rumor knew they were heisting the entire time, thanks once again to her magical powers, which normally help her keep an eye on all the workers in the hive, something that none of them are aware of. The cups end up getting banned from Rumor's residence for life, and they have to leave empty-handed. 
However, just as they're about to head home, that same worker bee that they ran into also leaves the building. Turns out that he was just fired by Rumor for reasons that she refuses to tell him, but he did decide to bring the cups the honey that they were after before he left. The cups are really thankful, but now the worker needs to find employment elsewhere. The cups actually recommend some of the stores that they visited earlier who were explicitly looking for work, and the worker bee says that he'll definitely check it out, and maybe even suggest it to his buddies. Hey, the less people working under that abusive tyrant, the better. They bring the honey to EK, he feels fit as a fiddle the next day, and all is right with the world. A pretty simple one on paper, but seeing the Cups and Chalice try to pull off a heist, seeing Chalice actually get mad that her charms are not working, and having Rumor as an omnipotent antagonist with her magical bee powers could be a lot of fun. A B-plus idea at the very least if executed well. And finally we have the old Samba Snapdragon doing his signature... I don't even know what you'd call that dance. Down low, too slow, down low, too slow, down low, too slow, down low, too slow. It's Cagney Carnation. And much to my surprise, he seems to be one of y'all's favorites according to the comments. You guys really like Cagney. I mean, you really, really, really like Cagney. And I can't blame you because I love him too. He's the final gatekeeper before you leave the first style, and what a freaking finale he is. Over the top movements, terrifying design, and super difficult if you don't know what you're doing. I mean, look at how many things could be going on at once. And his constant manic smile makes me think that he takes pleasure in fighting and torturing anyone he comes across. I get a lot of Agent of Chaos vibes from him. Like even when his soul is on the line, watching these cups squirm and run from his attacks just delights him to no end. So my best guess for a Cagney episode actually involves the Root Pack teaming up with him for some revenge against the Cup Bros, but in the end, he completely turns on them and actually causes a bit of island-wide chaos. It's a little insane, but here's my proposal for the Root of the Problem. It starts off with EK planting in his garden, just like the start of Root Pact, but we see that he has expanded his botanic palette, and has started planting flowers and hedges as well. He's even teaching the Cup Bros how to plant flowers properly and take care of them. That way they won't have to worry about trusting any outside help again. Cuphead gets bored and eventually starts doing something reckless. Like maybe he tries watering all the flowers at once with a hose which only ends up drowning them, or maybe trying to trim the hedges too much to the point where they just fall over. EK gets steamed and tells the boys to go buy some more seeds at pork rind so they can replace the flowers they destroyed, and they need to use their own money since it was their fault. All the while, the Root Pack have been spying on the bros from the bushes, outraged that their once swinging party place has now been overrun by a bunch of pansy pansies. They hop off angrily, still without a place to call home, until they happen across another garden filled with flowers, though this one is unattended. So they decide to stop by and have a drink, when who should show up but Cagney, claiming that this patch is his property. They explain that they didn't mean to intrude. They were just looking for a place to crash ever since those two cup craniums and the curmudgeon kettle crashed their party. They don't even grow veggies no more. They just grow flowers now. They're fluffing up the whole forest. And this whole thing piques Cagney's interest. Flower growers deep in the forest, you say? Hmm? Also, yes, I 100% imagine Cagney having a hymn from the Powerpuff Girls sounding voice. It's just too fitting. I'm sorry. Anyway, after the Roots point out the Kettle Residence, which is on the complete opposite side of Isle 1, just like in the game, Cagney strikes up a deal with them. He hands them a bag of green seeds and tells them that if they can convince the Cup Bros to bring these seeds home and plant them, not only will they have their revenge, but the Kettle Garden will be theirs for the taking. He even invites them back to his patch when they're done so they can all watch the chaos unfold. The Roots obviously can't pass up a deal like that, so they all go for it. They eventually convince the Cup Bros to bring the seeds home with them, like maybe they pull the whole mustache and glasses and trench coat routine, you know, those obvious disguises that somehow worked in older cartoons. Then they go back to Cagney and are ready to see what becomes of the bros. It starts off pretty good, the seeds sprout into these vines that just strangle the Cup family and immobilize them. But then the vines start letting off more seeds, which sprout into more vines, which start sucking all the water out of the nearby grass and trees. And Cagney is just watching this and laughing. Cuphead just barely frees his family by grabbing the shears he was using earlier. 
The pros run through the forest to find the source of all this and happen upon Cagney's garden. They see that the root pack have also been vined and completely sucked dry. Cagney says that he no longer needs their services anymore and tries to flick them away, but the Cup family actually use the shears to cut his vines so he can't touch them. They set the root pack free, and this could lead to an interesting fight scene where the Cup bros shear Cagney's vines and roots, while the pack sucks up all of Cagney's water to weaken him. And in the end, Cagney's defeated, the vines dissipate, and the root pack actually learn how it feels to be scammed for once. Then you can have a cute ending where the five of them reconcile, the root pack make it up to them by buying the seeds out of their own pockets, and the cup bros let them have a drink from their hose as a thank you. So yeah, maybe a little over the top, and we probably don't need to see the root pack come back, but it could make for a cute little bad guy redemption, a good excuse to have a cool fight scene, and a chance for our main antagonist who just wants to watch the world dehydrate, I guess. I don't know, it just sounds like it could be pretty fun. Alrighty folks, there you go, an episode idea for every boss in the original Cuphead game, with a few exceptions of course. I'd say this has been a super fun ride, but guess what? The ride might not be over quite yet. If you guys would like to see one final part where I write episodes for the DLC bosses, please let me know in the comments below. I have no clue if any DLC characters will even show up in the show besides Miss Chalice, but it's always fun to speculate. So please let me know in the comments below if you want to finish things off with one last course, or if you'd rather just take the check and head home. But until then, thanks for tuning in everybody, and I hope to see you all real soon.